Um, we are having four very interesting presentations this um, noon on how to design policies and what the challenges are. And I think this is a very important complement to what we already had in our panel. And now we come into how really can we design policies to implement that. Um, and I'm looking very much forward to our first presentation by Chinedu. I, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, fine. yeah. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, hello, my name is Chinedu, and um, today my presentation will touch upon um, the role of carbon price on biomass use in the Swedish iron and steel industry. And um, okay, yeah, good. Um, so um, I start now by um, um, having a brief overview of um, the iron and steel industry in Sweden, which accounts for um, over 50% of the total industrial fossil energy use and thus is um, a huge um, point, um, point source emitter of CO2. And um, increasingly there is um, the need to curtail the fossil CO2 emissions coming from this sector because um, it has to be in line with um, the national climate targets in Sweden and also um, the global steel industry, which aims towards less emissions during production. And um, substituting um, the existing fossil energy with biomass stands out as a short-term strategy that can be implemented to existing processes and technology in the industry today. And um, I'm going to emphasize that I'm speaking only about um, the existing still technologies and current fall use today. So this is not about um, technology overhauls like hybrid that is already um, ongoing or has already kicked off. So a short-term strategy and um, towards CO2 mitigation is what um, the focus is for this um, presentation. And um, using biomass as a substitute comes with its own um, limitations because not all fossil fuels in the industry today can be replaced. And this is probably mostly due to technological lock-ins, um, replacement ratios, and um, technical feasibility owing to material properties. So for instance, um, the coke, um, coking coal, which is um, used to make the coke, that is the reductant and the blast furnace, it's, um, Technically, um, it's not technically feasible to replace all of it. And um, this is something that has, um, that actually has to be addressed by changing the um, entire technology. So for instance, using hydrogen perhaps or using electricity for reduction. But at the same time, biomass is a limited resource that varies spatially. So the question of allocating and supplying large quantities of biomass to the steel plants across the country is quite important, especially since other industries demand for the same resources, either as a primary raw material or for their own CO2 mitigation. Um, but nonetheless, um, given the strong need to decarbonize the industry, the um, steel industry, we um, think about what possibilities or options exist to achieve net zero emissions with biomass in the short to medium term. And um, this is just a geographic view of um, the individual plants in the country. And it's um, a very wide extent from the north to south because Sweden is actually a long country. And this um, geographical positions actually stress the need for biomass supply, the need to address biomass supply and availability as well as um, plant localization for, the producing, for producing the different bio biomass-based products or bioproducts, as I will call it from now on. And um, also each of the plants have different um, fuel needs and substitution requirements. So all this is taken into account when we discuss how to use biomass. So um, the, aim and the aims of um, this study is to evaluate the potential for using biomass to achieve CO2 emission reductions in iron and steel production by first quantifying how much um, CO2 can actually be reduced, what's the maximum biomass 
or byproduct share that can be achieved and at what cost will it come for the industry that's for the iron and steel industry um, isi and to do this um, we first carry the start carry out the study by conducting an energy mapping to approximate the biomass demand that matches existing fossil energy use in each of the plants um, we bear in mind that there are different substitution potentials depending on the process um, processes or the process stages um, next, the energy balances and techno-economic data for the biomass conversion technologies, they are based on two main technologies. That's um, pyrolysis technology for charcoal production and gasification technologies for product gas and liquefied synthetic natural gas. Um, the hosting sites for integrated bioproduction are assumed to be steel sawmills and the steel plants themselves. And um, specific biomass assortments are selected for each technology endogenously in the supply chain model. And these assortments are mainly um, by, by, um, byproducts from the sawmills, as well as forest residues and, um, sorry, harvesting residues from the forest. Um, the um, supply chain model is a, bi is a specially explicit supply chain model, we were Sweden, sorry, and it's a techno-economic optimization model that minimizes um, the total cost for the entire system studied. The model is modified to study the Swedish iron and steel industry, and it includes um, the competing industries and their own biomass demand as well, and different biomass assortments and their supply transportation and distribution of the produced byproducts and policy instruments such as electricity certificates and CO2 prices. And um, the interesting part about how we use the model is um, the way we want to run it. So first it's designed into in two modes, first using um, varying levels of the EU ETS CO2 price and second, using, secondly, using a substitution mandate where the aim is to identify whether CO2 prices or this policy mandate would favor increased substitution and CO2 reduction. Um, by varying the CO2 prices with existing energy market prices, that's um, fossil fuel prices and biomass prices, it's possible to determine what impact or role carbon prices may play and by using the substitution targets, we want to see if it's um, or stress the need for maybe this, um, the importance of policy targets like this. And for this study, we use the reference year 2018, and this applies to the prices and their techno-economic data in the study. So um, first I show the, the first set of results that um, when we use a varying CO2 price. So we vary the CO2 price from zero to about 300 euro per ton of CO2. And this is um, an assumption for like the EU ETS prices. And we see that um, from the results that the byproduct preference is actually product gas. That's the light green bars here. And this is maintained until we achieve a CO2 price of um, 150 euro per ton of CO2. And then charcoal um, use starts to dominate in the solution, the model solution. And from this, we see that a maximum share of byproduct is reached at 42%, um, while the CO2 reduction potential is at a maximum of about 40%, yeah, 39.5%. And in the next slide, we'll see what's obtainable when we use um, substitution targets. So in the industry, if we um, try to use um, a fixed substitution target, so here in this first bar, there is no fixed target. So that's similar to the previous chart. And here, from here on, we say that, for instance, there should be at least 25% biomass use in the industry up to a full substitution. And the full substitution here is um, what is technically possible. So it's not, like I said initially, that it's not possible to replace all the falls with um, biomass. So 100% substitution here means what is technically possible. And to provide some context why we, this is here, this is um, using a CO2 price, um, existing CO2 price of 25 euro per ton. 
and we want to use this to compare what happens at this um, lower price. So from this second set of results, we see that the maximum byproduct share can be up to 48%, and this will be also similar for the CO2 reduction. But when there is no um, any mandates, we have a lower, um, a lower potential that's from 5.4. And there is also a more diverse mix of byproducts compared to the previous picture. And also, um, this is emphasized if we look at it spatially. So um, we see that the, the picture here on the left is when we use the high uh, maximum um, CO2 price of 200 euros. Um, this is when the, um, the, the, maximum CO, the maximum CO2 reduction achieved is 40% um, here. And here, this on the right, this is using a full substitution um, mandate. And um, we see that there is a more um, spread or distribution of the byproducts when there is this um, maximum um, mandate compared to when using a CO2 price of 200 euros. And um, if you want to consider what's the economic implication of either of the results shown, that's um, either using the CO2 prices or going with um, a desired mandate, we can show here that um, the, costs, the costs for using the biomass are actually comparative when you look at it within the different mandate levels. And this total costs, again, are inclusive of the biomass procurement cost, the technology cost for um, converting the biomass into the desired products and transportation and distribution of these products across to each of the plants that need it. Um, but we see that um, liquefied SNG in yellow here proves to be the costliest despite the small, smaller quantities that are being um, produced and utilized at each of the plants. And so um, economics of scales are observed when comparing the byproduct use versus the byproduct costs. And again, the costs are said to be comparative. If we want to compare this with um, or look at the cost competitiveness with the existing fossil fuels, for example, um, coke or fuel oils, which are used today in um, in the um, the iron iron pellets in iron pellet production at the mines. Um, we see that um, additional costs to the industry could fall within the range of um, two euros to thirty-seven euros for each megawatt hour of um, fossil fuel that is substituted depending on what is substituted, rather. And if we want to look at it from uh, um, the entire system perspective, we would see that um, compared to the business as usual case today, that is um, when there is no um, biomass used today, for each of the um, substitution levels that are being calculated and also comparing it to a situation where there is no fixed targets, Again, we're using the um, existing CO2 price of 25 euros. We would see that um, the, the, end, the cost for energy use for the industry would increase by approximately 27%. And um, there is not, there is um, rather a decrease in cost if the industry decides to um, not use this, um, this um, fixed mandate or rather to just leave it as it is and um, use the CO2 price at what it is today. And there would be a decrease and this is mostly because of the um, replacement of the fuels, are, um, the most expensive ones. So for instance, um, product gas replaces fuel oils, which are like at, at the, um, higher costs than what you would find for natural gas or even for coke. So this is why there is um, a decrease instead of an increase. But again, this um, actually um, points to a low hanging fruit for some of the plants in the country that they could easily, or rather it would be economically beneficial to switch to product gas. Although this study does not consider the cost for technology modifications, when switching from um, switching burners in the plants from LPG or LNG to using product gas. So um, I would just like to conclude by saying that um, higher CO2 price will necessitate um, 
biomass utilization in the absence of any substitution mandates or targets by the industry. But on the other hand, then implementing these mandates leads to um, a significant slash in CO2 emissions and even at lower CO2 prices. And then depending on the extent of the biomass utilization, additional costs to the industry can be up to a maximum of 27%. So um, a question that I would like to put up for um, discussion here is um, what would be um, suggestions to implement a policy or what policies will be necessary to um, promote or encourage um, biomass utilization, bearing in mind that there are actually high costs for the industry going either ways. So um, this is my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, yes. Okay, yeah, can I, um, I stop sharing now? Yes, thank you, okay. Chinegu, yes. for this uh, very interesting presentation right on the point in timing. Um, so we have time for questions and answers. You already put one question yourself. Um, Marlene, do you have questions for Chinegu? Uh, this con presentation was so interesting that I did not follow up on the, on oh, the okay. chat. Okay. Sorry for I, that. I can, okay. I can help you. I, po I posed one question. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I so, hope I wasn't too fast. Perfect. Uh, no. Okay. no. Um, uh, so uh, one question from my side. Um, you accounted for CO2 emissions and I was just wondering, did you in take into account indirect emissions, example from CH4, from methanization or land use effects? Uh, no, no, these were just direct um, emissions from the fossil fuel use. So mm -hmm. only for the fuels that are currently used. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we, um, so even, uh, okay, so I have to um, explain again that for this study, we also considered biomass to be CO2 neutral. So we don't take mm -hmm. into account any um, CO2 emissions from even the use of the biomass itself. So uh, um, if we do take more indirect emissions, perhaps the results will be a lot more different than what it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank I would you. have a question. Okay. In case there is no other question. So thank you very much for your nice presentation. I would have asked about the CO2 emission factor for the biomass as well, but you just have answered it. My next question would be, did you check whether there is the availability of that biomass? I saw that in the full scenario using um, biomass that there is a huge need in Glossolulia for biomass and is it available in a reasonable distance from that factory? Yes, so um, for each of the um, bioproducts we had, um, we assigned different um, biomass assortments. So for instance, in Lulio, the plant in Lulio here, there is uh, obviously higher need because of the amount of um, coal that needs to be replaced. So using um, um, wood pellets as some of the assortments together with um, byproducts from the sawmills in the area, there is actually enough um, um, an, enough biomass supply for this. And um, because it's the study is using um, an optimization model, so everything is optimized from the transportation down to the cost. So the results that are presented are like based on the optimization and we also took account, um, took into account the um, existing demand from other sectors like um, sawmills and um, CHP plants around. So there is actually um, a balance. So there is, I would say, based on our results, there is um, actually enough biomass to use in the steel sector. Okay, thank you. Yes. So there are more questions now okay. in the Zoom chat, Stefan. Okay. For instance, from Lars, the question he asked them um, if you considered uh, the competition for biomass, but I think you have just answered yes. that question as well. Yes. And Although, there is uh, sorry, if I could add, so the competition that we considered, we looked at it statically, so it's not um, 
looking at what could happen in the future with other existing demand. So it was based on um, the data we had for the reference year. Okay. And there is another question in the slide where you compare costs of biofuels with the cost of different fossil fuels. Are the fossil fuels cost including or exclude, uh, with, uh, with including or not ex including fuel tax? Yeah, that is exclusive of the CO2 tax for using those particular fuels. And uh, right. energy tax? Other taxes? Um, yeah, yeah, sorry. It's, um, this is inclusive of energy tax, yeah, because the prices are gotten from the data Swedish statistics. So that's inclusive of all the energy tax. So what the companies pay? Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think, do you have another question, Stefan? Yeah, if, uh, if you don't have any more, I then we can come back. I would have come back to Chinedu's question, but maybe you want to go first. Yeah, just now that we were speaking quite a lot about hybrid and I think hybrid published that they have an increase in operational costs between 20 and 30% using hydrogen. Yeah. And yeah, and you say the increase would be 25, 27% for the steel industry. So that would be in the range with hybrid. Yes except that um, with biomass, you don't um, get um, zero um, net zero emissions, unlike with hybrids. Although for the hybrid, there also still would be need for biomass to um, cover the ex additional carbon needs. So um, from the study, yeah, the additional costs are similar. So that's to show that um, biomass is actually has its own cost, especially with increasing demand it's possible that the assortments will become more expensive for even the industry to use. That, that's just will come about from um, competition, demand competition. Okay, thank you. Okay. There are two minutes thank left you. for okay. exactly. questions and answers. Um, so maybe um, to come back to your question, Shinidu, yeah. uh, you, un you asked for instruments. I didn't see anybody so far, but maybe the others can uh, cover that up in, in their presentations because there's more coming on instruments. One idea from my side, currently there's for heavy industries very much discussed something like contracts for difference or so on CO2 mitigation. Maybe that's a uh, point for you also to consider whether such contracts or auctioning of such contracts would be an instrument to support the use of biomass. I okay. mean, that's different from the CO2 price and also different from sort of quota system. Uh, and another option may be interesting to analyze. Okay, I'll check that. Thank you. You're welcome. And now we have five seconds left. So I think we switch to the next presentation. Um, the next presentation comes from Anna Leibrand. That's on towards a policy framework for a hydrogen future of German industry. So Anna, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stefan. Yeah, so um, I'm happy to present this, this work that um, we are doing at Wuppertal Institute together with colleagues at uh, German Economic Institute in the context of uh, the Sci for Climate project. Um, so this is about a policy framework for hydrogen um, from, a, from an industry perspective. And um, here, this is just to give a little bit of background. So hydrogen is, is high on the political agenda just now. So from, from uh, scenarios that, that reach high climate protection levels, something like 95, minus 95% 95 by 2050, we know that um, hydrogen and hydrogen derived products will be necessary for that. And for Germany, um, we um, expect um, hydrogen demand, and also demand for hydrogen and some fuels to reach significant levels by that time. Although we know, and as we also heard yesterday, there are uh, large uncertainties about the exact quantities and also about um, whether the, the hydrogen will be used directly or how much of it and how much of it will go into, um, uh, into pro, uh, power to gas or some fuels. Um, but in any case, it's clear that the hydrogen this is based on will have to be clean and its production will have to be compatible 
um, with sustainable energy production uh, transition. With, um, and um, also what we discuss in Germany is that it, um, no one expects every all of that hydrogen to be produced domestically, so import options are also being thought about and being developed. Um, since uh, summer uh, this year, we have um, political strategies both at EU level and at national level um, that paved the way for policy making. So they um, they set um, strategic targets for, for instance, for electrolyzer capacity by 2030. Um, they sketch the financial volumes that might be associated with that process, and also they um, they um, explore or mention uh, policy instruments that uh, that should be um, used or developed. However, the design of these individual policies and also the shape of a policy mix that could combine them in an efficient and effective way um, is still unclear and still discussed. And so um, against this background, um, what are, what, okay, this was too many clicks. <laughs> Try again. Yeah, so what, what we want to do here is um, assess the concepts for key policy instruments um, in terms of their potential contribution to facilitating a hydrogen system um, and uh, that, that supports overall energy transition. So we focus on domestic production or the conditions for domestic production and we focus on green hydrogen. Um, and we do that in a two-step approach. So we start by identifying or discussing the major challenges that policymakers are faced with and derive criteria from that. And then in a second step, we apply these criteria to policy instruments, trying to um, find out which design options or features could, could be um, um, appropriate to um, facilitate a robust entrance strategy. So I will start with the challenges. So the first one um, that we discuss is the, the cost issue. So the question, how can we uh, create a business case for hydrogen? So um, at the moment, the production costs of green hydrogen um, domestically are significantly higher than those of fossil-based hydrogen, and they will remain so for a while. So the, the graph uh, here, this is a global assessment, but it shows um, the expected development of um, hydrogen production costs for PV and wind um, for average conditions. So these are the circles. Um, and for best case conditions, this is the, the filled, um, the, the dots, the green and blue dots. So the, um, the average conditions would sort of correspond to what to the German situation. And you see that at the moment, and it compares to the fossil-based hydrogen, in this case, blue hydrogen, which is the corridor between the um, dotted lines at the bottom. So what? Um, so it's clear that at the moment, they are much higher and they will only become competitive um, after 2030. Um, on top of that, um, we have domestic levies and charges on electricity that drive up uh, production costs. Um, production costs also vary with full load hours. And then we have um, new applications of hydrogen, for instance, in steel or chemi chemical industry that will also cause extra costs. So um, the message here is that domestic electrolysis um, for, uh, has no business case, or hydrogen has no business case today. State support is likely to be needed in significant amounts, which again, of course, raises the question of um, macroeconomic efficiency, distributional consequences, um, et cetera. Um, then the second issue is how can we, how can the green hydrogen be produced sustainably? Um, and so um, something happened to the graph, but um, so the, um, in the graph on the far right, this is um, hydrogen from uh, electricity based with re renewable energy only. So that has a very, an almost zero carbon footprint. However, the yellow um, uh, column, um, if you do uh, electric, electricity-based hydrogen with the current electricity mix, the, hydro the carbon footprint is actually pretty high, higher than fossil-based, um, the gray and the blue ones. So um, uh, also electrolyzer operators have an incentive to uh, go for high full load hours because it makes it more economical. However, if you do um, high full load hours, under, so if you operate electrolyzers continuously under current conditions, 
you would produce hydrogen with a high carbon footprint, or if you buy the renewable electricity for that, you might drive up CO2 emissions elsewhere. So um, here, the conclusion really is that green hydrogen will only contribute to emission reductions if there's additional renewable energy capacity that is, um, that is built and used for hydrogen production. Um, and then the third issue we uh, think about is um, who, gets the, who gets the hydrogen. And so there are different potential users. And we have those areas, for instance, uh, energy intensive industry, but also some parts of transport where there are no few alternatives to hydrogen use if you want to go for full emission reduction, um, but where costs are likely are, are high. And then you have areas um, uh, like cars and heating or refineries where, where clean hydrogen can replace um, the fuels that are currently used or the input uh, that are currently used, but uh, where energetic efficiency compared to, for instance, direct electrification uh, may be low. So policymakers would have to take that into account when they design markets and incentives, because this also will de determine uh, which actors gain access to, to scarce um, hydrogen supplies under what conditions. And then the fourth um, challenge that we propose is the buildup of transport infrastructure. So uh, currently there's no long distance pipeline uh, grid for um, hydrogen. But um, there's a large consensus that pipeline transport will be relevant in the future, at least for the supply to, to certain um, users and at least for some connections. So gas grid operators are thinking about um, how to build up a large scale network. So the graph, the, the figure here shows um, a, a visionary grid for the future that is based uh, largely on the conversion of existing natural gas pipelines. So by building up this infrastructure, given the high uncertainties about the supplies and the location of supply and the quantities and also uh, the, the uses um, also is a big challenge. So then um, what we, so then we, we basically translate these, um, these challenges into criteria. So we propose that um, the policy mix for hydrogen should um, support a business case um, and the reduction of costs for green hydrogen production while taking into account macroeconomic efficiency. Second, it should ensure um, that additional renewable energy is used and that the production of um, hydrogen is in line with um, the systemic demands of the electricity system. Third criterion is uh, the policy mix should provide clear signals to create planning security and it should uh, ideally target support to those users that, that, that can make the most, most of the hydrogen in terms of, uh, of climate mitigation. And then the fourth um, criterion is uh, it should enable the buildup of transport infrastructure. So now um, um, I'm coming to the discussion of policies and it is a, um, just a, a broad overview. So what policy instruments do we have and how would they relate to the criteria? So first thing you could do is reform the taxes and charges on electricity. Um, so, for instance, if uh, electrolyzers get an exemptions from, from these charges, th that would um, reduce the cost gap and improve their competitiveness. Um, however, um, it could also lead to a situation where um, electrolyzers is, um, the operation of electrolyzers is not um, contributing, to, contributing to the overall system. So this really depends on the design. Um, also, it could lead to thinking about more comprehensive reforms that also consider um, that create incentives for flexible use um, and that uh, take into account uh, uh, sector coupling demands. Another thing that the chef, Stefan also mentioned is direct funding and support instruments. And here we talk a lot, lot um, about carbon contracts for difference that would target support to uh, the users of hydrogen, for instance, such as uh, steel makers or chemical industry, um, and also um, market-based support for hydrogen production directly. So that also would reduce the cost gap. Um, it, uh, and it would also, uh, depending on who gets access to these instruments, uh, 
influence uh, yeah which target sectors are um, uh, are the first or the um, preferred users of hydrogen um, then we have um, a third option that would be the quotas so so here market actors would be obliged to produce or distribute a certain share of either clean hydrogen or clean hydrogen based products um, and that would also um, yeah it would create a secure market and secure demand it would also to some degree then put the hydrogen into these specific markets um, however there's um, this this instrument is still being discussed and there are lots of questions to be uh, to be clarified um, if you if uh, as a policymaker you think about implementing more than one instrument that addresses the cost issue, you should then also think about interactions between them and um, coordinating them in a way that avoids, for instance, over or double funding. Um, another um, potential uh, lever for, um, for supporting hydrogen uh, buildup is the implementation of the Renewable Energy Directive um, from 2018. So this directive um, allows member states, when implementing it, to make um, the use of clean hydrogen in fuel production accountable for the renewable energy target in transport. So if a refinery um, operator replaces uh, fossil hydrogen by clean hydrogen in the refinery process, um, while still producing a fossil uh, fuel, uh, he could, um, this would pay into his uh, renewable energy target. Um, and so this would, in this sector, be a relatively, relatively cheap mitigation option. So, um, on, uh, on the, so this would um, also address the cost issue. However, there's concern that it could risk, uh, lead to a risk of locking in fossil fuel production for longer than we might want it. Um, um, also, um, what's needed very urgently is a regulation of infrastructure for hydrogen. So, um, regulate, regulate hydrogen as a gas um, and develop the institutional and financial framework uh, in order to um, uh, make it possible for investors here to, to, um, to act and to, uh, to start developing the infrastructure. And then eventually we look at guarantees of origin. So, this, these are um, these inform about environmental attributes of hydrogen, and um, so this is also where the the second criterion, um, sustainable production, additional renewable energy, could be uh, addressed directly. And these uh, GOs are also the prerequisite for other instruments um, because they um, they uh, systematize um, the the uh, characteristics of the hydrogen types. So um, this is uh, my last slide. So this, this was just a very brief overview, but um, here I, want, I would like for a discussion, I would like to highlight that there seems to be one major trade-off and that is on the one hand, we want to facilitate early investment and scale up of the technologies. On the other, we need to ensure sustainability um, now, but also over, the, over time. Um, and so, uh, what we propose uh, as an approach to address this is uh, to distinguish between uh, short-term policies that could be temporary and that focus on this um, on this first goal to facilitate um, the kickstarting um, and then a policy package that uh, for transition that accompanies this activity and that then sets the clear signals for long-term targets and that coordinates funding instruments in a way that um, that avoids um, or that, that takes account of um, interactions between instruments um, that pays account, uh, attention to um, the sustainable production issue uh, and um, that avoids over and double support. So um, I think time is over and I'll stop here. But as this is all very much still work in progress, I, I look forward to having your ideas and, and comments on this. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Anna. Perfect. Uh, and I'm also looking forward to questions and remarks to this interesting presentation. Marlene, yeah. do you have already some? Yeah, this was also a very interesting 
presentation, but I remember that it's my duty to look in the chat. So there is a question and it is um, the policies you mentioned, you mentioned are production based. Have you considered policies that created demand instead like requiring hydrogen use in green public procurement? Um, yeah, I mean, we, um, thank you for the question. We, um, I think uh, we do not um, actually uh, at the moment have this per particular instrument in the paper, um, but I think it relates closely to the, to the, um, to thinking about standards and quota um, approaches. So we do have the demand side um, um, approach in there. Um, but for, for the sake of keeping this manageable, the public procurement isn't here. Okay, thank you very much. This was the question from Johan, and I'm not sure, was it the same that you have posed in the Zoom chat as well? Yeah, but there is another one. So when considering challenges, did you discuss questions related to safety and safe ending? Yeah, that was the other question from, from Johan, I think. So did you discuss safety issues? Mm -hmm. No, um, also we do not uh, discuss safety issues in this paper because this is, um, but um, I, we, in the context of the Slide for Climate project, we have sort of a broader approach to the whole hydrogen discussion and where we also look at the more technical issues. And I guess there um, are colleagues that, that deal with this, um, this issue. So if, um, so I guess we could have a discussion on that in, in another context too. Okay, thank you very much. And there is another question. So a very general question. What do you think about the viability of blue hydrogen from Russia? This is a question asked from Lars. So what do you think about blue hydrogen from Russia? I think that's uh, hydrogen we import from Russia, but that is based on... on yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a there's a big discussion, of course, uh, about um, one the question of imports and also about blue hydrogen versus green hydrogen. Um, and um, there's, I think, I mean, the uh, the advantages or the the, the chances are that um, those um, countries that now at the moment export fossil fuels to us. Um, could sort of change to um, to green, I mean, green or blue hydrogen or, or synthetic fuels or whatever. Um, so, um, but um, as I said at the beginning, so this isn't really also the focus of the paper. So at, um, in, the, in the project, we discussed the question of, do we need blue hydrogen as a maybe temporary solution um, as um, intensely? So, because if we don't have um, the, if you can't produce enough green hydrogen in a sustainable way, um, and if demand rises up faster than supply, then maybe the blue hydrogen could be um, could be something that that could bridge this gap. Um, but I think that there are lots of questions to be clarified and to be discussed, and a lot of modeling to be done to know whether this is really something that um, that would help or something that would risk lock in. Yeah, thank you. And Lars was so brave to also ask if Germans, because I think Lars is Swedish, if Germans would buy this blue hydrogen from Russia. <laughs> so, but, and, and Stefan, did you? Yeah, I Stefan think, replied uh, already I, to the audience. I think we need to say <laughs> that in public because this Zoom chat is just for us. So Stefan replied to that, if we do not get enough green hydrogen from Scandinavia, Okay, so Lena, uh, Anna, what, what do you say on that? Uh, I don't feel, uh, I don't know, entitled to answer their questions. I'm not <laughs> the government. And I know that they are, uh, I mean, both at EU level and at, uh, in, at the national level, um, there's a lot of strategic discussion about where to import hydrogen from. Um, and I think that the EU strategy, for instance, has Ukraine, um, I mean, gives more <laughs> focus to Ukraine, if I'm, if I'm correct, than Russia. But I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, yeah, say more to that. 
I think it's good not to answer two questions. One is not in charge of that much. So I think I would be fine with that, Stefan. Shall we yes, go um, to the next presentation? Time is almost over, but there is also one remark um, from uh, there is here another in the, here, and up, in the question say. and the question and answer. I'm not sure. I think we should stick to the time and Anna can answer the question later on in Hoover. So that is what I would suggest. Okay, yeah. good. Then let's uh, go over and uh, we have some time later on on the interesting hydrogen de debate. Um, <clears throat> now we have also a very interesting presentation by Lars Nilsson on a European industrial development policy for prosperity and zero emissions. So I think that's the most general presentation today and I'm very much looking forward to it. Lars, please. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, I think it's the, the I, I have missed big parts of EC3PLE because yesterday morning I was in Brussels and then in the afternoon I was in Bratislava and now to Gothenburg. So you become, it's easy to move between places when you're just in front of the, the computer. So yes, uh, I'm here to give you a fairly general presentation to uh, uh, present and discuss an idea about a framework for industrial policy. It's, uh, it's an issue we've been struggling with for some time, but now in the context of the uh, reInvent Horizon 2020 project, where we are looking into some of the, the so-called hard to abate sectors, we deal with paper, plastics and steel, and also, but also meat and dairy, uh, came the opportunity to actually write a paper that we have thought about for, for a long time. And in that process, we were also writing policy briefs uh, during uh, January and February when the EU industrial strategy was in, in the making. So we were trying to feed some of our ideas into that. Um, let's see. Uh, the slides won't move. Uh, Abena says I can control. I'll try again. Ah, there it is. Quite a big delay. Um, the uh, first something general about industrial emissions. Um, looking at the statistics, the industrial emissions are growing faster than for any other sector since 2000. And this is very much driven by the increased uh, extraction and production of, of basic materials. And as you see in the slide, much of this is driven by, by Eastern Asia. Uh, we see, of course, that the share of industry in total emissions will increase, especially as we decarbonize energy and transport. Uh, we see among those basic materials that plastics is the one growing the fastest. And we're already seeing signs that focus is shifting to, to looking at materials. For example, when debating battery cars, the focus is on the emissions from, from the uh, lithium extracted, a lot, of, lot more interest now in, in building materials when we look at, at passive houses and zero energy houses that if you look at the life cycle, half or more of the emissions might come actually from the materials rather than the use phase. So we see more and more interest in, in materials and heavy industry. Um, we did this as a big collective effort. And I have, I have difficulties changing slides here. Could you take back uh, control? Thank you, Abena. Uh, it was a big collective effort between some colleagues here at uh, Lund University uh, and some international colleagues. And oops, yes, Stefan Lechtenbermer was also contributing. Thank you, Stefan. But anyway, it was a broad mix of people that sort of covered expertise on industry, technology options, economics, understanding the politics, and innovation system research. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we took a starting point in 
different literatures and strands of thought on industrial and, and climate policy. Now, uh, industrial policy is not new. Countries have used it forever. It did get a bad name, especially, I think, after the structural crisis in the 1970s, when it was mainly used to sort of protect and shelter old industries like the shipyard industry or the textiles. Uh, and we saw, for example, how shipyards shut down in Sweden and other parts of Europe moving to South Korea. Now South Korea see their shipyards be moved to China. So things are changing all the time in industry. Sometimes it's used to protect and shelter what's new. And sometimes that works very well. One can talk about vertical industrial policies, which are targeted at specific sectors. And you can talk about horizontal uh, industrial policies. Uh, it's also about how you view uh, climate issue. If you see it as a pollution problem that only needs carbon pricing, or if you see, uh, see it as a broader systemic change, which involves a broader transformation to sustainability. So not just about reducing the emissions themselves, but a broad range of, of, uh, of activities. Uh, there's some literature on innovation policy framings by Schotten Steinmüller, who looked at different phases in innovation policy, how it was originally focused on technology push through R&D, uh, going through a period from the 1970s to sort of nurture innovation systems more broadly to make them work better, but without any real direction to what we've seen in the past 10 years, the need to mobilize innovation policy to, to meet societal needs. So clear direction for societal needs, including, of course, uh, the climate issue. And then we have the field of, of green growth discussion and the need for system innovation, which have been discussed by many. Uh, much of the green growth discussion has focused very much on, you know, high tech solutions, uh, batteries and fuel cells and very little attention to the basic materials industry. So from our point of view, the basic materials industry has been largely forgotten from a climate or innovation or industrial policy perspective until very recently. If we move to the next slide. Uh, there's been a flurry of policy recommendations in, in recent years. I've listed only a few here, the draft master plan, the IT50 project, carbon market watch, center for European policy studies, climate strategies. Maybe I think uh, Timo Garris is in the audience. Maybe you were in, involved in that one. Uh, the corporate leaders group, and then came in the spring, the EU industrial strategy. Um, so there's, there's a lot out there. Uh, most of these uh, recommendations, uh, of course, include the need for innovation. Many of them talk about the need to create market demand, but it's often limited to sort of public procurement, public green procurement. Some of them discuss infrastructure needs. Um, if we look at the EU industrial strategy, um, that a, is a document that clearly points out a direction. They talk about the need for innovation. They talk about public procurement and uh, carbon border adjustments are, are also mentioned. How am I doing for time, Stefan? I have about five minutes, right? So, yeah. Um, and there's a lot out there. Uh, the hybrid project had an opinion piece in a Swedish newspaper where they asked for uh, carbon prices, they asked for low price electricity, they wanted uh, simpler permit or faster permit procedures, and they asked for possibilities to share risks with, with government. Uh, so a lot of things out there. And if we go to the last slide, uh, building on what was out there, building on this background in, in industrial climate and innovation policy, this is sort of the framework that we came up with for thinking about industrial policy. 
And of course, it all starts with creating some sort of direction because you have to know where you want to go. And we see that developing a lot now with visions and roadmaps. It's not everywhere. We see in steel that there's both hydrogen and CCUS. Uh, but if we go to petrochemicals and plastics, they basically have no vision or joint vision for how they could, could decarbonize. Uh, I think in that context, it's, it's important to think also about the whole value chains, including uh, uh, consumption and demand and, and materials efficiency. Because if you, broad, if you look more broadly at the value chains, you, you find a, a greater number of opportunities. If you, if you ask the steel industry for a roadmap, they will come up with ways of, of reducing emissions from primary production. But if you ask the construction industry for a roadmap, you come up with a much broader range of options, including materials efficiency and recycling and circular economy. Of course, uh, innovation is, is still important, uh, not least uh, because we see changes happen, new sectoral co couplings. Annika Tönnies uh, talked earlier today about uh, some examples of that, of uh, industrial symbiosis. Uh, creating and reshaping markets, we need to look at it in a much broader way than just uh, public procurement. It's about also de-risking investments, because if you do one of these investments, you, have, you can have technology risks, you can have market risks, but you also have the political risks that the political system is not uh, delivering. And uh, the government should somehow take care of these political risks. I think we had a clear example of that in the ETS scheme where many power companies in Europe sort of optimized their portfolios on the expectation of a carbon price of 20 or 30 euros per ton. And then when that didn't materialize, they didn't have the right production portfolio and much of the natural gas combined cycle plants were shut down or, or mothballed. Uh, also in this contract context, uh, uh, contracts for difference uh, sounds like a very uh, attractive approach to, to uh, reduce those risks. Then there's the capacity for governance. And, and capacity, I think, includes academic capacity. I think it's only in 2018 that ECEEE started to discuss deep decarbonization in, in heavy industry. So it, it is a new issue. Uh, there's not that many academics involved in, in looking at, at this. And I think we need much more research in it. But we also need to build capacity in governments. If you compare industrial decarbonization to, if you look at energy or transport, these are policy domains that have been around for decades with ministries, government agencies, institutes, whole academic departments working in these areas. Uh, when looking at industrial decarbonization, I think we're only at, at the beginning here. Uh, international coherence is important and it's not only about carbon leakage and carbon border adjustments, it's also understanding how we can act from the European side to get this into NDCs, use sectoral leadership approaches, try to big, build coalitions of, of the willing or climate clubs as it has also been called. Uh, and finally, uh, looking also at the phase out sunset industries and how to deal with them, because we have a lot of oil refineries in Europe, for example, that we won't need in, in 10, 20, 30 years time. Um, if we go back to the EU industrial strategy, I think it contains a lot of good stuff, good elements. It is a bit weak on trying to look at consumption and uh, material demand and material efficiency. It's not really in there. And I think those are very different parts of a strategy to decarbonize the heavy industry. And it's also rather weak on this issue of uh, international coherence and di diplomatic strategy under UNFCCC to try to get other countries to also uh, get involved in understanding how, what kind of transitions they can make in industry. So thank you very much for listening and over to the moderators.
Maybe I have yes. one more slide, uh, Aben. I don't know. Ah, there's a thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. The, the game over ring is just to come for you, but you perfectly made it in time. Thanks a lot, Lars, for these, I think, um, very good ideas and really giving us a comprehensive picture of the field that we are talking here in panel six all the time uh, from this policy and, and governance perspective. Um, Marlene, are there questions? Um, I checked and I updated. Yeah, there is a question. What role do you see for different actors, for instance, academia, academia um, to play in supporting the development of a sound industrial policy? So who is in charge of these policies? Well, uh, policies are developed by policymakers and policymakers are subject to a lot of lobbying and pressure. And so, yeah, I think academia, academia has an important role to play, both by uh, sort of being uh, a critic and for transparency, but I also think in terms of generating ideas, analyzing ideas, uh, for example, this idea of, of contracts for difference, I think it's something that is taking hold in, in many circles as, a, as an interesting way of uh, de-risking investments. Um, but yeah, there, there's a role for, for everyone. Okay, thank you. There is some... Yeah, there is another question. So how to push industry decarbonization policy forward? A workable way forward to get individual member states to move early trying out different innovation policies? Yes, thank you. That's a question from Johan. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a, a good question. Um, I would also advocate a, because we need a lot of uh, experimentation now and, and room for member states to try out different policies. We already see one of the problems, if we look back, has been this, uh, the state aid regulations. And, and uh, you know, we need to loosen some of that uh, because in, in the heavy industry, it's often very big investments. So we, we might have to do some exceptions from the state aid rules. We might want to put some of this into what's called the IPCASE, Industrial Projects of Co Common European Interest. Um, so yeah, trying out different innovative policies in different places in Europe, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. I think adding to that question, I would like, it's my question, who should pay the bill then if you say of experiment or if you say that we need experiments, that it's also about losing and burning money, maybe who will pay the bill in the end and how much money should be spent on this industrial transition? I think you and I, Marlene, we always pay in the end <laughs> somehow. Uh, but it, you know, it, you have to use a mix of sticks and carrots and uh, balance that possibly with preventing carbon leakage. So you have to work your way through it. But I mean, the good news here, Marlene, is that uh, the bill is not very high for us. You know, if we, um, Johan, I will leave it to you to pick a number for how much it will affect Marlene's budget. But I think it's a, it's a few hundred euros, two to 300 euros uh, per capita to, to handle this decarbonization of heavy industry. I just pulled that number out of my head now and wait for you one to confirm it. Okay. Yes, I think there are uh, a couple of studies, uh, for example, uh, estimating what would be a car from uh, zero carbon steel cost more or a building from zero carbon cement. We had discussed that yesterday with Heidelberg cement and that's mm. always uh, in the range of a percent. 
sometimes yep. a little more, sometimes a little less. So for the final consumers, really, uh, we can afford, we could afford, we have to get it organized. Another way of looking at it, Stefan, is that if you take the basic materials primary production step, uh, it only represents like 2% of, of Euro European GDP. So it's not, it's not big in economic size. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so, so that's a... Uh, Johan, Johan thinks that it's less than I spent on candy. So I'm not sure if he knows how much I spent on candy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> less than you spent on music, Marlene. Um, so... Uh, I, can I just uh, say hi to everyone I know in the audience? Yes, of course. Uh, okay. Okay, we haven't allowed for this before, but uh, as it's you, we allow that. Um, maybe, um, Marlene, is there any more questions to I ask? have not. Just a second. Um, no, the last one was from, from Johan, so there are no more questions and... Yeah, okay, so then, could... then maybe a remark from my side on the role of science. I think this this panel, and therefore I'm very happy to have that panel, and that we have so many uh, good papers in this panel, and we had many applications, I would uh, say. Um, this is very important, not only for the policy or on uh, policy proposals that Lars mentioned, but also on the scenarios that we heard on the technical analysis. I think it's very important to have independent knowledge in the room in order to move forward. And I think what we are discussing here and what people present here are doing in the field is extremely important to get industrial transition done. Okay. Um, I'm looking at Marlene, but I think there are no more questions and uh, I, it's well, we are well in time. So I suggest we start now with Johan Rotzin. He has the last presentation with the catchy title, Electrify Everything. I think that's very great in the afternoon that you electrify our audience now, Johan. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, I'll do my best. And good day, everyone. Really uh, happy to take part in this panel. I've been following all the previous presentations and I'm um, happy to see that uh, the challenge related to decarbonizing industries really starting to get the att attention it de deserves. Uh, but <laughs> all the good work pre presented before me also means that a lot of the stuff I will be discussing here is pr probably already covered, but you can see it maybe as a recap. Um, and also, it also means that uh, this this new info coming in also means that we probably need to update update some of the data in our our work. But thanks to all the previous speakers. So my name is Johan Rutzen. I am currently at the Department of Economics at the University of Gothenburg. Uh, it's a pity that you can't all be here uh, these days, but uh, maybe. Ne the next EC Tripoli. Uh, the study has been conducted together with three col uh, colleagues, Holger Wirtzema, who is uh, presenting another paper in parallel uh, here today, uh, and uh, Magnus Brulin and Jesse Fanestock, who, is, who are both at, at the RICE Research Institute of Sweden. And the focus is on um, yeah, challenges and opportunities uh, related to um, increased electrification of industrial processes. So it's kind of a relatively sweeping uh, work, a synthesis of, 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 uh, of uh, previous, uh, previous work. Um, I'm trying to switch slides, let's see. Here we go. Yeah, so, so you've heard the background more or less, but uh, anyway, uh, so we all know if we're going to move to zero emissions by the middle of the century, competition for uh, low 
CO2 energy carriers will be fierce. And options for uh, available for industry are are few. We've heard uh, biomass biofuels discussed today, today, and as we know, there there are questions related to the availability of resources, uh, land competition, and so on. Uh, carbon capture and storage has also been been discussed, um, and uh, question marks there as well political will, social acceptability, and the question of uh, continu continuing relying on fossil fuels. Uh, so uh, in that, with that background, uh, uh, as we've also, also discussed previously, we'll probably need a mix, but with that background, maybe electrification uh, is, uh, comes in a brighter light both direct electrification in, and indirect electrification. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, you, you all know the, uh, the, the explanation that we see a, a decreasing cost for renewable power generation and energy story, storage technologies. And that raises the hope of ele electrifying uh, a greater share of uh, energy use in general. Um, and uh, and uh, also industry. Uh, trying to switch. Maybe, maybe, yeah, thanks. Maybe I can tell you, uh, Abina. Doesn't seem to work. So we outlined and uh, discussed five areas which we have identified as critical for electrification of industry in the EU. Uh, we discuss uh, interlinkages with an electricity system in transition, uh, the development of support infrastructure, uh, changing patterns of competition and production, trends in material demand, uh, and uh, the challenge related to unlocking investment in low or CO zero CO2 emission processes in general and uh, for electric, electrified processes, particularly here. So next slide, please. So to the first of these, um, uh, uh, so we, we see already today that the large shares on the supply side of the electricity system, a large shares of variable renewable electricity is coming into the system. And uh, if, we, if we're going to reach zero emissions by 2045 or 50, uh, we will need even more. Um, and uh, so I think it's diff diff important to consider all, all this uh, together, both what, what's happening on the supply side and uh, also on the demand side. So on the demand side, uh, it's not only the, obviously not, not only the, industry that is looking into electrification but also um, transportation and uh, and uh, building sector uh, and what happens in those sector will be important to, uh, for what what will be po possible to do in the industry sector as well i think and vice versa um, and uh, in short uh, looking on the very uh, high up scale uh, uh, looking at the studies that were available before this conference, at least, we see a uh, large variation in estimates of EU industry electric electricity demand in 2050, ranging from yeah, somewhere between 1,300 and 4,500 uh, terawatt hours. And uh, yeah, th that's a pretty wide range to make uh, serious play, pl plan out, plans out of, out of. Uh, so we have to yeah that, that is a reason to continue looking closer to this um, yeah we see which also has also been discussed previously high ge geographical concentration very high loads in certain regions North Rhine-Westfalen Port of Rotterdam northern Sweden and so on uh, we also see that uh, most of this industry demand growth is suggested to come in in a very short time period. period. 
uh, yeah, and it, it, this question is uh, of course interesting uh, for industry in general, but when it comes to, to uh, uh, large electricity demand, it is uh, the steel, cement and chemical industries perhaps, or Patrick, uh, that makes the biggest mark. <clears throat> and in, in particular, perhaps the chemical industry, depending on what, uh, what uh, technical choices they make. Uh, uh, yes. I think it's also too important to, so we, we've discussed uh, during this panel sessions a lot with the, with the channel, challenges involved in supplying all of this electricity, but it's also important to look into the positive uh, side benefits of electrification, I think beyond, beyond uh, reducing CO2 emissions. Uh, cleaner production processes in general, easier uh, processes to control and so forward. Um, yes, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, and related to, to this, uh, uh, electricity su supply obviously needs to be uh, zero CO2 uh, zero CO2 emissions within a, in, within a couple of decades for industry decarbonization to to make sense. So we need a massive ramp up of investments in new zero carbon power capacity. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, one of the one of the studies that is synthesized in this work we've looked into compared uh, the rate of ramp up uh, in the coming de decade and compared it to what has happened uh, historically and uh, uh, even if we have been built a lot in many parts of Europe uh, uh, during the last decade we have to keep and probably uh, increase that ramp up rate the coming decades. So, so that, that, that will of course be a challenge. Um, and also, the, which has also been discussed previously, this, the question of uh, how to uh, roll out support uh, infrastructure in a timely manner. Uh, these things uh, tend to take time. Uh, I think uh, my colleague Jan Schastad uh, talked about a transmission uh, project here in Sweden, which uh, has been ongoing for 15 years and still isn't uh, operating. So, uh, yeah, we really have to start uh, the planning process and as soon as possible uh, for strategic uh, infrastructure. Joel, Next. Just to let you know that you have five more minutes. Yep, great. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, okay, so th this is this is, this we have perhaps not discussed so much uh, in the panel so far, but I think it's uh, interesting to bear in mind that uh, um, if this, uh, uh, if the world uh, starts to move according to the Paris Agreement, uh, production and supply of basic material with zero to zero to emissions becomes uh, competitive. Uh, we may start seeing competitions from uh, regions we are not, uh, perhaps not that used to. When it comes to iron and steel, uh, Australia and Brazil, for example, which has both uh, large iron ore resources and uh, good uh, re renewable energy endowments. Uh, this is perhaps not a, a, as big a challenge in the cement industry. In the chemical industry, there will be maybe similar concerns to look out for. Or if, if I don't know, from a global perspective, it's not maybe not a concern, but from, from a European perspective. Uh, yep, next slide, please. Um, Yes, uh, this has also been discussed, but the, 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 um, the importance of also looking at uh, the, what can be done on the de demand side. Uh, do everything we can to 
to uh, limit or, or uh, hopefully even push down uh, the use of these uh, uh, basic materials. Use, use them as smart and efficient as, as possible. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the, this is uh, continuing on uh, on Lar what Lars just uh, discussed. The question related to unlocking investments in these technical shifts. Um, um, and there are at least three three pieces ne needed there. Uh, R&D funding, uh, de-risking of investments through price premiums or carbon contracts for difference, and also to to spur de demand for this, secure demand for this, uh, uh, this uh, clean, but uh, probably more ex expensive products. For example, through procurement requirements or private initiatives like bio collisions and uh, clubs. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. I think that's it for me, actually. I look forward to questions. Uh, please reach out if, we, if there's something we don't have time to cover here. Please, please uh, reach out to me. Uh, you have my con contact information here. Uh, I would also like to show one final slide. Uh, uh, just to, um, you've also seen this, uh, many of you, but if you haven't, uh, please check out the research network on industrial decarbonization where we try to uh, uh, yeah, continue um, uh, finding collaboration and uh, continuing the discussions we've had uh, uh, throughout this uh, this panel um, so check that out please and thank you very much uh, for listening look forward to your questions Yes, thank you, Johan. Great. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Again, structuring the field very well from a slightly different angle. I think that's very helpful. And also many thanks for uh, pointing us at the network of Renew Industry. I think that neatly fits to the discussion we had before. Yeah, uh, Marlene, I think we have some questions for Johan. Yeah, there are two questions. Um... I will start with a second one. So do you know, Johan, of any studies that look into the potential for renovating or repurposing existing assets? For example, going from a blast furnace to a hydrogen direct reduction means totally new investments. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, maybe the work uh, Tobias Flight uh, presented the other day is along those lines where they compared uh, a gas development in the industry compared to electrification industry where the gas development would be more in line with using, uh, using ex existing infrastructures. Um, that, that's, that's definitely a uh, very interesting question. Um, a lot, a lot of this, a lot, a lot of the uh, um, the electrification tracks uh, and technologies, like Tobias also discussed, uh, would uh, mean pretty large uh, uh, investments and shifts uh, at the sites. So, so when I raised this uh, reuse and existing assets, that was, that was mo mostly po pointing to the, towards the demand side. So instead of building new roads, uh, uh, new buildings, con considering using what we've got and maybe renovating instead, but avoiding new building there. But, but this is definitely interesting also in the okay. industry Thanks. Side. There is a second question to you and Stefan at a time, also from Lars. So regions that cannot provide electricity or hydrogen infrastructure may be in trouble, question mark. Perhaps easier to provide POR with infrastructure than North Rhine-Westphalia, question mark. Port of Rotterdam. Uh -huh. Ah, Port of Rotterdam. Thanks for that. Yeah, what do you say, Stefan? 
<laughs> okay, I I can start and and you uh, follow. Yes, I think that's that's really uh, an issue that could happen in the future. Um, if we have uh, this pressure that we already see in some sectors of customers uh, wanting to buy uh, low carbon materials, and if it's really uh, easier to produce that elsewhere, that can have uh, such effects. And so, yes, maybe uh, having access uh, to large amount of green energy, be it electricity or hydrogen, um, can be a um, locational factor and can be an important strategy aspect for, for our regions. And uh, maybe uh, in, in panel two on, on Monday, there was a presentation from a colleague uh, from Wuppertal Institute. And um, there was an analysis on the chemical industry in Europe. And it's clear that there could be a, a shift to the coast because ports like uh, in, in Sweden or Rotterdam or Belgium have sometimes uh, easier access to some of the green feedstocks that may come from abroad where renewable energies is much more cheaper. So it could really become an issue. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but I, I guess it also relates to uh, I relates to a lot, lot of things. But the question of this, the question of just transition, can we uh, just uh, maybe maybe we have to uh, pay attention to certain regions, which will really be affected of our shifts, uh, uh, how they can um, remain, remain competitive. Mm -hmm. um, that has a value, I think. And also, uh, it's easy to undervalue uh, the, the value of competent, competence in this region. Uh, uh, maybe the value of that, the know-how that is already there is perhaps uh, worth a lot compared to the, the cost saving of uh, cheap renewable electricity in some cases. I don't have any answers, but... Uh... Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We, Stefan, we promised to answer or to um, put the question to Anna still. So mm -hmm. we have two minutes left. Yeah. So maybe this is the point of... Um, yeah, but but there is one question for Johan still in the. There are two uh, questions. So, okay, good. But you are so proposing I think to Johan, you need to go to Uber and answer the questions there. There are two more questions for you to. or for anybody. So. Yeah. Okay. So shall we ask that question to Anna? Anna, are you still there? I am. I am. Yes. So here's a final question to you. According to your work, implementing electrolyzers today would generate significant wow. greenhouse gas emissions. Is there a strategy to support early adoption of electrolyzers given the current electricity mix? So is it reasonable to support the implementation of electrolyzers with the current electricity mix? Yeah, um, I, uh, I guess that the, uh, the first strategy should be to encourage the use of excess electricity for electrolysis. Uh, I mean, renewable um, electricity that currently cannot be used. Um, and so that would be the first uh, strategy. And then the second should be to um, expand renewable energy capacity. So this would have to be taken into account by, by government targets for renewable energy expansion. So that this uh, extra um, demand for electricity um, in order to make that uh, compatible with a strategy that, that builds electrolysis. Okay, that, so thank you. Stefan. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot to all. Uh, that was, again, a very interesting session in our panel six. Um, thanks to our speakers and thanks to the audience, to good questions and uh, attending the meeting. Um, yes. And uh, so please stay online in half an hour at uh, two o'clock. We will uh, start with our uh, final session of panel six, um, <clears throat> where we go back again a bit more deeper in specific uh, technological and process solutions for deep decarbonization of industry. Thanks a lot to everybody and I enjoyed it with you.
I'm missing to meet you in person. Yeah, me too. Thank you very much for all the presentations and to the audience for all the questions. Thank you very and much. Hopefully see Thank you at two. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.